joy of the Lord with us here this morning. If you'll look at your bulletin with me here this morning, just some brief announcements. Um, if this is your first time visiting with us, we want you to feel welcome. We want you to enjoy the Lord with us. We ask that if, if this is your first time, you'll fill this out. It's a perforated section here on the side, just so that we can have a record of your visit. We hope that you're encouraged in the Lord here this morning. Other brief announcements. Remember that next Saturday, September the 2nd, is our monthly sleeping mat workshop. And that is from uh, 9 to 11 a.m. So these are mats for the homeless. Is it Mad Matters? Yeah. They're called the Mad Matters. And so, um, but Miss Donna is over this ministry. And if you'd like to help, she can always use help. She needs people who will uh, donate to grocery bags and those who will cut them and flatten them and, and loop them and crochet them. Right? And so they need all kinds of help for that ministry. And it's a great ministry. And so with winter approaching, there are going to be more folks who need these mats. And so if you have any questions, you can Donna. And, but that is next Saturday, 9 to 11. And then uh, Saturday, September 9th, is our True Hope Helping Hands ministry from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. If you want to volunteer for that, you can see Ms. Garnett or Ms. Linda Ferris about that ministry. And you see that we're still seeking donations for that, baby wipes, baby food, items like that. Uh, to where what we do is folks come in who have uh, young children. And we seek to help them. We share the gospel with them. And then we seek to provide for needs that they might have. But it's an opportunity um, for us to show the love of Christ. And also to, to tell people how to be saved. How to become a Christian. How to enjoy the grace that we enjoy. And so if you'd like to help with that, please see Ms. Garden. I think that's a wonderful ministry as well. And then seeing that the polls coming up September 22nd, young people, um, pay attention to that date. And that is September the 27th. Wednesday. All right, any other announcements? You'll notice in your bulletin this calendar, I'll encourage you to refer to that. If you have any questions, you can see me or Misty, but Michael, Ms. Michelle. And uh, also pay attention to the um, the Wednesday night meal ministry meals on wheels. Uh, if you have any questions about that, you can see Brother Delane or Miss Sandy. All right, and uh, how many meals did you prepare this past week? Is over 28. 28? So that, that is a ministry where they're ministering to folks um, who, who, uh, who may have come home from surgery, who may be sick, or they may be shut in. And that's uh, just seeking to help and encourage those folks. And so there's, there's many people involved in that, but they can always use help for that. Y'all need cooks and you need deliverers, right? Amen. All right. So if you have any questions about helping with that ministry, please let them know. Anything else, friends? All right, well, we're about to approach the Lord in worship, and so we need to prepare our hearts, okay? And so when you approach the Lord, you want it, you want it to be a, you, you know, we need to enjoy this time and enjoy one another's fellowship. We also need to seek to enjoy the Lord. And so we come admitting that we need the one that we're about to sing about and we're about to sing to. And so between you and the Lord, if you have any unconfessed sin, come confessing it, but then get up and sing like the redeemed. Get up and sing like you actually have a Savior who's resurrected actually have a Savior who intercedes for you before His Father. So in other words, you seem like you've been forgiven. So let's bow again. Father, I thank You for this time. I thank You that You are gracious and loving and You have proven this by giving Your only begotten Son for us. And so Lord, all of us that have come to You through Him by the power of the Holy Spirit, may we rise up and sing truth to you and about you. May we teach one another as we exalt you. And may we enjoy forgiveness. May we enjoy salvation. May we not sing like folks who need redemption if we're trusting in Christ. May we sing like those who have already been forgiven. And may we rise up and enjoy you in Christ's name. Amen. Church, won't you stand and encourage one another in the name of Christ here this morning. Amen.
together and continue worshiping the song of hymn number 372, Our God Reigns. We can all read verses in this video. <laughs> Thank you. 
you know, with all the bravado that goes into that and selling the client, or they so say, uh, there's only one name that's going to be remembered in eternity, and that's not McGregor or Mayweather. That's Jesus Christ. You know, that's the name that echoes. That's the name that's above every name. Um, and we get our value, our inherent value, our inherent salvation, everything that we get um, in our relationship to God the Father is through the finished work of God the Son. It is because His name is above every name. And we are in Him. It's by virtue of being in Christ that our names are exalted. See, our names are not written by in the Lamb's Book of Life because we have somehow went around the Son to get to the Father. It's because we are in the Son. It's because of faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith in what He has done for us in living a perfect life and laying down His life for our sins, rising from the dead to forgive us our sins. You know, trusting in Christ, it's by virtue of being in Him. And so I want to encourage you to think about that reality, that if the Son's name is exalted, then and the inheritance that He deserves, you want to go to Him. You don't want to run to the mirror for your justification to God. You want to run to Christ. You want to run to the one who laid down His life for you. You know, uh, the Apostle Paul said it this way, Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Talking about Christ, he said, Therefore God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so part of what we're preaching and what we emphasize here at this church is we're, we're really trying to get folks to bow now because one day every knee shall bow wherever they're at. Whether they're in, in heaven or they're in hell, every knee shall bow and come confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You can either bow voluntarily now and be saved or be forced to bow one day. But make no mistake, everyone will bow. And we're pleading with folks to bow now so that, so that you can be forgiven. Those who bow now are saved forevermore. But those who wait to bow their freedom will be taken away from them. And they'll be forced to admit that the church was right. That Christ was right. That day is coming. And so we offer salvation now. You know, I'm reminded of a, uh, it was a Jewish fellow who was on a radio show. And, uh, you know, there were uh, differing religions. There was a theological, you know, mainstream um, staunchly liberal believe that basically, you know, everybody's going to heaven, universalist type. And then there was a, another fellow who believed um, something similar. And then there was an evangelical Christian like we believe. And he was actually a, a, he was raised a Jew. And he trusted in Christ as the Messiah. And the, the news, you know, the interview person, the interviewer asked him, the Jewish fellow who was a Christian, Asked him, said, you know, are your people, if your people don't put their faith in Christ, um, will they go to heaven? And the fella, you know, he was a teacher at New Bible College, he started weeping. And uh, the interviewer said it's one of the most compelling cases he's had he's heard for Christianity. And see, that's what that's what we must emphasize. Listen, Christ reigns supreme, and everything that the Bible says is true. And if the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that day is coming. It's, it's more certain than the sun rising and setting. I mean, it is coming. And so the best way to prepare people is to preach the truth of the gospel, not to whitewash it, not to act as if it's not true. See, if folks would tell you that you're okay, that you can stand before God dressed in your own righteousness, if folks would tell you that your good works can save you, those folks are not telling you the truth. The truth is that I need Jesus and you need Jesus. And if our works could save us, it makes no sense that He would come and lay down His life for us. And so we, we've got to trust in Christ. If you're going to be saved, you've got to trust in Christ. If you want to be forgiven of your guilt and the sin that's in your heart, you've got to come to Jesus. You've got to trust in the One who is the radiance of God's glory, the exact imprint of His nature. The first point, 
So we see that God the Son is supreme. He's the radiance of God's glory. You see this in verse 3. And the exact imprint of his nature. So who is this Jesus Christ? Who is he? You know, John 14, 8 through 11, Philip says to Christ, he says, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus says to him, listen, this is startling. Have I been with you so long and you still don't, do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does His works. Believe me, and I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. And so Jesus reveals the Father because He is God. Because He is God. He's God the Son. Now, we've been discussing this for several weeks now, talking about the Trinity. Now, there is one God who eternally exists as three distinct <coughs> persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so, what you have in Christ is God the Son, who remains fully God, uniting to a human nature. So, He, he is one person, divine person, who has two natures. And these natures are not separate they are united in the person of the Son, but yet they remain distinct. They are not a mixture. Jesus is not some third substance. He is not 100% God-man. He is 100% God and 100% man. And so you have the fullness of the Godhead dwelling, God the Son incarnate, while also He remains 100% God. Now, there is mystery here, but this is what the Bible seems to teach. Very clear. Very clear on this reality. I mean, you, you have numerous examples in the New Testament where, um, I mean, where the apostles are calling Jesus Theos, which is God in Greek, and they're referring to Him as Kyrios, which is Lord. It's the equivalent of Yahweh in the Old Testament. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, the New Testament... Authors, they knew exactly what they were saying about who Jesus is. And there's no mistaking who they believed he was. And the question is, will we agree with them? And even the author of Hebrews, look at what he says. He says that Jesus Christ is the exact nature. The nature of a thing, the nature of God, the nature of a human being, is, how do I say it? It's whatness. What makes you, what's essential to make you what you are. That's what your nature is. Who you are is your person. What you are is your nature. And so when he refers to him as the exact imprint of the nature of God, he's speaking of what makes God God makes Christ who he is. And so there, there's mystery here. But at the very least, we cannot say that he's saying Jesus is something less than God. Jesus is God the Son incarnate. He's the radiance of the glory of God because he is God. To see him is to see the Father. To know him is to know the Father. And by the way, when you're, when you're telling folks, that when we preach the gospel... We're telling people about Jesus. We're trying to get them to have a relationship with the maker of heaven and earth. We're trying to get them to have a relationship with the, the one who makes their hearts beat. Who gave, gave life to their children. Who created everything they love in this world. And that's what we're trying. It's amazing that, how deceptive sin is. Because people are so blinded. That they can have a, a relationship with the maker of all things. And they'd rather have sin that leads to death. It always leads to death. It always leads to the grave. It always promises life. And there's never been anyone who's been led to life through sin. Never. Billions of people going to their grave. And sin's always telling you, you're not going to your grave. We're whispering just like the serpent did in the garden. You will not surely die. You're the exception. Billions have come before you. 
and they died, and sin led to death for them, but not you. Not you. No, sin will lead to happiness. It hasn't led to happiness for anybody else before you, but you will lead to happiness. It will lead to joy. Oh, your wildest dream. Oh, the deception of sin. It always leads to death while always promising life. And yet, here comes Christ. When man could not save himself, God came to save him. When we could not fulfill the demands of God, God came and fulfilled His own demands and then laid down His life as if He broke His own demands. Amen. So that the lawbreakers could go free. So that sinners could go free. So that instead of deserving God's wrath in Christ, because He has taken our penalty, I literally, concerning my salvation, oh, no more. Because God the Son has paid my penalty. So the Father is not coming to me de demanding a payment. The Father has paid it in full. And so I enjoy this one who is supreme. We also see God the Son is supreme because He upholds the universe by the word of His power. And you see that this is very interesting. This proves again that He is God. He upholds the universe by the word of His power. God the Son is the divine sustainer of all creation. He literally holds all things together. The Apostle John in John 1, 1 through 5 said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so Christ being the maker and sustainer of all things, doesn't that mean, if that is true, doesn't that mean that He is authority over us? Doesn't that mean that He is authority over all creation? See, God is not asking you to give you something that, to give Him something that really belongs to you. I mean, you don't make your heart beat. You don't determine when you leave this earth, or whether or not you're going to live tonight, we don't determine that. Ultimately, everything that we have is from above. <clears throat> the reason why our hearts are beating ultimately is because the sustainer of all things, Christ, is making our hearts beat. Do you remember when Job lost everything that he bowed in worship and said, The Lord gives. And the Lord takes away, right? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. He is the one who is in control of all things. It is not ultimately us. I'm reminded of Francis Schaeffer. Francis Schaeffer was a Christian philosopher. Very solid as far as defending the faith. I mean, go read his writings. He is, uh, he is very, very helpful. But he said if he had an hour on a plane with a non-Christian, someone who was a non-believer... He said he would spend 50 minutes at least discussing creation, arguing that God is the maker of heaven and earth. And he'd spend the rest of the time sharing the gospel. But see, if you can convince people, if they believe in a creator, it means that we're not the boss of our own life. As much as we like our freedom, as much as we enjoy our freedom, we're really not as free as we think we are. The maker of heaven and earth is the one who's in control ultimately, not us. Now, you made a choice to be here, but who made your heart beat? Who gave you the ability to be here? Who provides for your food? Who gives you the health that you use? Who is really the one that is holding you up? It's not you. It's God. It's God. And so, what we're, what we're encouraging you to do is simply to acknowledge fact. Simply to acknowledge fact. And not only acknowledge, but you can know the one who made you. And so for, for folks who deny this reality, one day they'll believe it. One day, folks who said, Jesus is not in control of my life, I am. One day they're going to stand before him. And he's going to say, either enter thy rest, thy good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. And every day, every person on, on earth who's ever lived, on that day, we'll believe, we'll believe that Christ is Lord. Amen. Because if He's not Lord, why is He judging everyone? And why 
what's he determining? Where they spend eternity? In other words, he's in control. He's going to show his authority one day. And so we're pleading with folks to enjoy him now. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. We have a tendency to think that the reason why, you know, I understand the science and laws a little bit. Brother King can probably help me a lot on that. Um, he's a scientist, a physicist, is that what he is? Physicist. Um, but those laws, but the one who makes those laws and holds all things together, you know, Christ could end all things immediately if he so chose. And one day he's going to return. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And friend, you can know him. You can know him. You can have a relationship with him. You can know him in a way the world does not know him. You can know him as Savior, as Lord. The third thing I want you to see is that he has authority, the authority of God. Look at verse number three. We'll finish this uh, verse, number three, and we've got verse number four. It says, After making pur purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so God the Son made purification for sins in obedience to his Father. Now let me read you Hebrews 9, 11 and 12. And this is a wonderful reality. God's Word says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, talking about heaven, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of His own blood, the securing and eternal redemption. And so you have the Old Testament picture, the sacrificial system, and the high priest who would go and make atonement for the sins of the people. He would have to atone for his own sins before he entered the Holy of Holies. But Jesus Christ, who entered the Holy of Holies of heaven, did not have to atone for his own sin. But he had none. And then he sprinkled his precious blood on that altar, providing eternal redemption. So Israel had to do those sacrifices daily and then yearly. I mean, they had to do them all the time. Blood flowed all the time as a constant reminder of the fact that their sins had not been forgiven, had not been cleansed, that they were going to be saved. It was due to faith in Yahweh and not the act of the sacrifice. I mean, we're going to learn in Hebrews that the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin, and it never could. There's always faith in Yahweh. And so we had all that pointing ahead to this ultimate sacrifice, pointing to the fact that the Son, in obedience to His Father, became our high priest. And you know what? If Jesus is our high priest, we don't need any others. And this is something that the Catholic Church doesn't understand. There's a reason why I'm not a priest. Jesus Christ is your mediator. I am. And you don't need any other. I have no power to cleanse you of sin. No other man does. I have no power to tell you what to do. There's no reason for you to confess your sin to me. Confess them to Christ. You can go to the Holy of Holies. You don't have to go through anyone else. You can go to Him directly because of what He has done for you. And if He's the high priest, He's the last one. The final high priest. The perfect high priest. In other words, the Pope is not a high priest. The Pope isn't even a priest. He has no authority. So we need to understand these realities, who Jesus is, go to Him directly because of what He has done. He sat down at the right hand of God the Father in heaven when He finished the Father's work, the work the Father sent Him to accomplish. And the sitting next to God the Father, the right hand, is a position of authority. And so He has inherited a name that is above every name precisely because of who He is. And we see this in verse number 4. So God the Son is supreme. Not only because He has the authority of God. But also He is superior to the angels. You see this in verse number 4. Having become as much superior to angels. As the name He has inherited. Is more excellent than theirs. And so pertaining to His divinity. Who He is. God the Son. He has inherited 
Indeed, a name that is above every name, pertaining to His humanity. He has earned the name that is above every name. He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law. Everything that God demanded of man, He fulfilled it. And when His work was done, what did He do? He sat down, when He made purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God to show Him His authority. Until what? Until the day that the Father, what? Makes his enemies his what? Footstool. What do you do with a footstool? Put your feet on it. You prop your feet on it, right? That footstool doesn't have any authority over you, does it? I mean, think about how the Bible describes the billions of the enemies who are against Christ. And what is coming of that day. These folks think that they have authority. That they are going to be able to stop Christianity or that they are going to be able to stop the ministry of the body of Christ, the church. But the Bible describes them as merely footstools for Christ. Think about it. Think about how amazing that description is and how, how startling that is. But this is not just any man. This is God the Son incarnate. One day, everyone will believe, even those who have took the lives of Christians, will one day bow before the one that they rejected. One day they will admit that He is the Christ, that He is Lord. But repentance will not be possible on that day. And that's what's so terrifying. See, we need to go to our neighbors and share the gospel. We need to go to the enemies, those who are rebelling against the church, and we need to love them, and we need to reach out to them. We need to plead with them to trust in Jesus. Friend, I realize that we cannot, uh, you cannot make anyone. I wish I could drag everybody down to the altar, right? Could drag everybody in the community, force them to come. But you can't. It can't be coerced. They have to freely come. And so we must lovingly plead with folks. Listen, if you're here and you're an unbeliever, I plead with you to trust in Jesus. I plead with you to take something that doesn't ultimately belong to you, which is your life, and to give it to the one who it belongs to, God. He gave His only Son for you. If you'll repent and believe, He will save you. He will cleanse you of everything you've ever done or ever will do. The guilt that is in your heart will be wiped away. It doesn't matter. And you can say, Brother Jared, I've done some awful things. Probably most people in this room have. I mean, look at the patriarchs in the Old Testament. Look at King David. We all need the finished work of Christ. Friend, if you'll trust in Him, He will save you. If you'll come to Him, He will cleanse you. There's nothing greater than knowing God as Father. There's nothing greater than being united to Christ by the power of the Spirit. To where my sin becomes His, where He's treated like a sinner. And his inheritance, his righteousness becomes our by faith. So we see here this reality that he is even superior to the angels. Now I want you to read something startling. Turn over to Ephesians 1, 16 through 23. And listen to what the Apostle Paul says about this. And you and I, so if Christ is superior to the angels, okay, he'll judge angels one day. Listen to what the Bible says about believers, about you and me. Instead of the saints, 
Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? And so, friend, what does that mean? That means that you're so united to Christ that Christ is going to judge angels and that in Christ, you too and me, all believers, will judge angels and unbelievers one day. I mean, that, that's what the Bible clearly teaches. That's what the Apostle Paul clearly teaches. And he actually uses it as an argument for why they shouldn't be taking trivial matter. They, in other words, they should be able to have a court in the local church where they are making able to, to make decisions amongst themselves because one day they'll judge angels. And it's very, very interesting. And so, friend, what can we do with this wonderful reality that God the Son is supreme? And it is a wonderful reality. This is a good thing. This is a good thing. This means that no, no one else is supreme. That God the Son is supreme over all things. And so if you are in Him, can you ever be lost again? No. Romans 8 says you can't be. <clears throat> And see, so when folks, you know, we have brothers and sisters in Christ who believe you can lose your salvation. And so when folks make arguments like that, my appeal is not to the mirror. My appeal is not to, you know, I'm such a good person, that's why I'm going to heaven, or that's or, or I've been good enough to keep my salvation, or my good works, you know, have somehow I've kept myself in Christ. No, my appeal is to the promises of God. My appeal is just, just like we read about how Christians are going to judge angels. I mean, the Apostle Paul is writing the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth is the immoral church in the Bible. He's writing the immoral church in the Bible, and he's telling them, don't you know that you'll judge angels? Why are you taking your dirty laundry and putting it in front of the world and having them judge it. You need to be able to judge this stuff among yourselves because you're going to judge angels one day. You're so united to Christ that you're going to judge those He judges. And friends, so what will we do with this wonderful reality that our salvation is secure because the one who is supreme, though you may let go, He won't. Amen. Though you may struggle with sin, and all of us do, to one degree or another. It is not our obedience, ultimately, that saves us. It is what Christ has done for us. And so that should encourage you. And so the reason why you live the Christian life is not so that you will continue being saved. It is because you are saved. And the Apostle Paul appeals to that throughout the book, I mean, throughout the New Testament. He's saying, this is what Christ has done for you. You're in Him. So live like it, right? So live out of what Christ has done for you. So you're not trying to just keep yourself in Christ. Oh, Lord, please continue loving me savingly today. But instead, you're enjoying the grace of God every single day. So it's all about what He has done for you. And so in other words, stop looking in the mirror and look to Christ. Stop looking in the mirror as the basis of your salvation and look to Christ. Look to Christ. You will not find joy if you meticulously examine yourself because you will convince yourself that you're lost. But friend, when you look to Christ, you'll never be lost again. Because I know one thing. When I came to Christ when I was 17 years old, friend, I didn't deserve him. In utter rebellion, and he saved me. And here, you know, almost 20 years later, I still don't deserve what he's done for me. After 20 years of living the Christian life, preaching for almost 18 years now, I don't deserve salvation anymore today than I did when I started. In other words, it's I, grace, 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 grace from beginning to end. And so won't you enjoy the grace of God? Won't you get up and enjoy the grace of God? Live like you've been forgiven. Live like you're redeemed. 
Live like your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, never to be erased. Even the devil himself can't reach the Lamb's Book of Life to erase your name. Enjoy your salvation. Let's see as Brother Kenny leads us in the hymn of invitation. Let's all stand and respond how God may be leading. Listen, if you want to come pray, come pray. If you want to come and enjoy the grace of God, you say, Brother Jared, I've never put my trust in Jesus Christ. Don't you come publicly today and admit that you need Christ and come and be forgiven. Be forgiven for all you've ever done. Come and be saved. Come and enjoy God's grace. Son's holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. 